We're going to continue this morning in the book of Haggai, and we're going to begin with a brief review. I pray you open your heart, because I, want, I believe the Lord's going to speak to us something very strong and very powerful, and He's going to do something wonderful for us. If we have ears to hear, if we have a, a heart full of faith that believes, I don't have any doubt that we will leave this place changed this morning. And that's, that's my expectation. When I come to the house of the Lord, I want to leave different. I want to leave changed. Amen. And uh, it's not a matter of whether God wants to do that. It's a matter of whether we allow God to do it. And so this morning, I am anticipating he's going to move and he's going to minister to us. So let me give you a very, very brief review. The book of Haggai, two little chapters, powerful scriptures, a powerful book that speaks prophetically to where we're at today. And I say that without reservation. And if we look at the uh, review of what was happening at the time, Babylon had conquered Jerusalem because of uh, Judah's rebellion, because of their disobedience, because they hardened their heart to the voice of the prophets, God's messengers. Uh, God said, okay, that's enough. And uh, he raised up King Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, Babylon and King Nebuchadnezzar, they attacked uh, Jerusalem, conquered Jerusalem, and they enslaved the people. But some of the people, the real, the nobles and the ones that they deemed were worthy, like Daniel, like um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they took them into exile where they served in the courts of the king. Seventy years passed. And according to the prophetic word of God, after 70 years, God was going to bring them out of captivity. And so it was at this time that he stirred the heart of King Cyrus of Persia, a heathen king. He did not know God, but this heathen king declared that God is going to release his people. And he, he wrote a document. He made a decree. He wrote it in his own, in his own writing. He sealed it. And he sent forth certain people out of Jerusalem, out of Babylon, to go back to Jerusalem and build the house of God that was destroyed, okay? And so he sent them, not only with a decree, he sent them with gold and silver and resources. He even sent them with troops to guard and protect them on their journey. So God had blessed a remnant of people to come out of Babylon for this one intent and one purpose and that was to build the house of God that was broken down to restore the house of God so the key scripture that we were looking at last week was that or two weeks ago is that God stirred he stirred the heart of King Cyrus it's the sovereign work of God Cyrus didn't wake up and have a good idea God Almighty stirred him, moved on his heart, and gave him a decree and, and caused the people of God to have favor Okay, from this king, from this man. Then it says God stirred the heart of Zerubbabel, the governor, and then he stirred the heart of, uh, of, of Joshua, the high priest. Then he stirred the heart of the remnant. Okay, And because God had stirred their heart, they went forth and they began the work of rebuilding the house of the Lord. Very important. They didn't get a good idea, right? They didn't all go out. You know what we really should do? We really should get to church and build this thing right. We really ought to go and we ought to restore the, the, the house of God. No, the, the, the Bible says God stirred their heart. It was the plan of God. Unless the Lord builds the house. That's a key in this whole message. God is building his house. The ideas of man, the plans of man, all the efforts of man have been futile. It has not succeeded. If anything, we've gotten in God's way. But God is coming today as he did in that day. And he's saying, I'm raising up a remnant that have an ear to hear, whose spirit I can stir because it's time to build the house of God. Amen. Amen. And I thank God he's given me an ear to hear. He has stirred my heart. I don't take it for granted. I didn't have a good idea. I didn't read it somewhere. Thank you, Lord. You stirred my heart. He's stirring our hearts to be part of what he's doing in this hour. May we never take it for granted. Amen? So all of this is a prophetic picture 
of what God is doing in the church. The early church was wonderful. It was powerful. We read in the book of Acts and say, look, at, look what God did in the early church. Look at the glory of, the, of that temple. And yet what happened? They fell into uh, you know, compromise and religion, and they ended up in Babylon. They ended up in religious confusion, right? It went right into the dark ages, like a thousand years, and then God began to restore through the reformers. In the last 500 years, he's been restoring the stones in our foundation. But God is bringing the church to a time today for those that have an ear to hear and those who allow the Lord to stir their hearts. We realize it's time to finish this thing. It's time to complete and build the house of God. And guess what the promise is? The glory of the Lord is going to be greater in the house that we have today than it was in the early church. God's about to do something so glorious. But he does it through remnant. He does it through a people that have an ear to hear and a heart to respond and a willingness to work and give themselves wholly to the work of God. That's where I believe we're at. So let's go back to our narrative. God's people began their mission. They came out of uh, Babylon. They came with zeal and passion, a fresh word from God. And they started out good. They started to work on the temple and rebuild the temple. And, and, and they took the resources of God. And they took their skills and talents. And there was great joy and unity. And they're rebuilding the house. And then all of a sudden, they started to get distracted. They started to get discouraged. The Samaritans began to harass them and intimidate them and fear uh, gripped their heart. And so they drew back from, this, from their mission. Their mission was to build God's house, but they found themselves drawing back to their own affairs, working on their own house, doing their own thing, consumed in their own private life. And this went on for 15 years. For 15 years, God was patient. For 15 years, he's watching and watching, trying to stir them. And finally, he raised up this guy named Haggai. And Haggai brought the word of the Lord and said, Hey, folks, consider your ways. What are you doing? You came here. You were delivered out of bondage and captivity to build my house. What happened to you? How'd you get distracted? What a word. And it's such a clear word for us today. So let's look. Let's look at the narrative, and we're going to go through the next couple weeks, Lord willing, we're going to go right on through and finish this book, and it is going to speak, I believe, it's going to speak to you in such a personal way and bring real ministry and deliverance and, and, and stir our hearts, amen? So let's look at the first five verses. This is, the, this is his message. This is what he's saying to the people. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai, <coughs> uh, the prophet under Zerubbabel. Remember, Zerubbabel cleaned up the rubble. That's what I learned. That's what I remember from Bible school. Zerubbabel cleaned up the rubble. The son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of uh, Josedek, the high priest, saying... Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people, my people here, this people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you to dwell in your sealed or paneled houses, and this house, my house, lies in waste? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Now therefore... Is that, did I already read that? Okay. Now, the base of the temple had been completed. The brazen altar had been built, but they stopped right there for 15 years, okay? And so it's still in a lot of rubble and ruin, and again, discouragement and, and, and doubt, and all these things began to grip the hearts of the people, and they drew away from the project, and so Haggai comes in his first words to the people. He gathers together all the remnant that, had come, that came out of Jerusalem that were given a specific mission. He says, hey, folks, thus saith the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. Consider your ways. Wow. Now notice that God's messenger spoke first to uh, the governor and the priest because he always speaks to his, 
his uh, leadership, it's his appointed way. Then he speaks to the remnant, those that had an ear to speak. And if you were here two weeks ago, we talked about the king priest ministry, that whenever God builds his house, he establishes the order of Melchizedek, right? The kingly priestly ministry. God is merging the ministry of the king and the priest together to build the house of God. Study Hebrews 5, 6, and 7 talks all about Melchizedek. It's the priestly order that builds the house. And, and, and God's calling us to all enter into that ministry. You have the ministry of Melchizedek, a whole nother story, and we talked about it a, a while back. But the crux of Haggai's initial word is, hey, everybody's saying it's not time to build my house. Hmm. And notice he addresses, he addresses them and says, this people, oh, not good. Not a good sign when God calls his people this people. You know why he said this people? Because they weren't acting like my people. They weren't really acting like the people of God who would be obedient, that would do what he called them to do with passion. He said, hey, this people, this people says, say, it's not time to build the house. Where did you get that? But thank God, the whole message is a message of grace. Because God is saying, okay, you got distracted. You kind of fell away. But we're going to redeem that. That's why I sent my prophet. I didn't send him to rebuke you. I sent him to stir you once again and get perspective, amen, and get back in the program. So Haggai says, you people are saying it's not time to build the house. And he's saying, who told you this? Where did you get that message, right? We seem to have a breakdown of communications here because God is saying clearly, it's the time to build my house. But the people are saying, no, it's the time to not build your house. We're going to kind of build our own house. Ouch. Now, God's response is consider your ways. Now, here's the crux, the clear revelation that we need to have because God is saying this. We need to grasp this to truly understand that the house that God is building, he's building in three dimensions or three expressions or three experiences. The first is the global house, the house of God that fills the whole earth, right? The church of God in the earth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The universal church, the church in China, the church in Russia, the church in Ukraine, the church in America. It's one global church together, okay? It's the church that Haggai is going to later say that it's the desire of all nations and all men will come to it. Isaiah 60 says the same thing. Oh, God, enlarge our vision. What God is doing, he's building a church. He, he's establishing a kingdom that's going to fill the earth. But then there's a second dimension, and that is the local church. He's building a house called Eastgate Christian Fellowship. He's building a house that's every individual local church that he's raised up and established and every regional city church he's raising up and they are being built up as the temple of God. Hallelujah. But this is what we need to hear. And that is, first and foremost, the house that he's building, the house that he is putting all his attention, all his resources in, the house that he wants to restore and build is this house, your house, my house. Know ye not, you are the temple, the house of God. And he wants to <clears throat> rebuild us. You're the temple. Everything we're going to talk about directly speaks to you and how God wants to build you, restore you. You and I are the living temple of God. God never desired. He said, I, didn't, I don't dwell in, 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 in buildings of brick and stone. I dwell in a people. It's been my heart. It's been my desire. And so the house that he's building is you and I. And so what, what does that mean? Somewhere along the way of you and I, after we initially got saved and God began to build this house, somewhere some of us got discouraged. Come on, some of us got, you know, distracted. Some of us lost our passion. Some of us have fallen into fear and intimidation of the enemy. So many different things. But God is saying, I began that good work in you. I began to build this thing in you. But somewhere along the line, life happens. Right? We get distracted. We go through things and we find ourselves not having the same passion, not having the same zeal to pursue God and let him build the house unless the Lord builds the house. Right? Now, 
God is saying to us personally, in many ways, you have fallen back into your old ways. You have fallen back into something that is not why I, I redeemed you and saved you and called you out of Babylon, where there was once a passion and a zeal just to know me, pursue me, just to love. I was your first love, and all the stuff of the world has drawn many away to now their, their, their passion and their, and their desire and their attention is in their own house. Hmm. you've not allowed me to complete my work. Isn't it interesting? They did build the brazen altar and stopped. And if you have, uh, have any understanding of the furniture in God's house, the brazen altar is the place of salvation. Hmm. You started out good. You really started out good, but you stopped moving forward. You stopped in, in all that I've called you to do. He was basically saying you have a divided heart. Your heart was once on the altar. Your heart was once a heart that cried out to me. A heart that said, God, have your way. A heart that was so overwhelmed that God would choose you in the midst of your sin and deprivation. And God chose you and called you and filled you with his love and grace, gave you purpose. Hallelujah. Oh, it's so good. But somewhere along the line. Amen. Everybody smile. And we just looked at it. The Hebrew word for build. He said, you're going to build my house. You're going to build my house. The Hebrew word for build is banal, B-A-N-A-H. And it's the root word, ben, the word for son. That, that's wonderful. And oftentimes when a person was addressed in, in, in Hebrew days, they were called ben. You ever see Ben-Hur? Judah Ben-Hur. Judah, son of her, okay? Ben, Ben means a son. And it's the root word of God saying, I'm going to build a house. What are we saying? God's house is a son, a daughter. Whenever we say a daughter or a son, how many you know there's no gender in the spirit? So nobody's going to get upset that we're talking about men and not ladies. Come on. Come on. If you can be, if I can be part of the bride, ladies, you can be part of a sonship. So, God is building a family of sons. Jesus was the first fruit that brought many sons to glory. Okay? So this is essential for us to understand. You may be sitting here this week or the week before we began this series and go, you know, this is interesting, but you know, what's this got to do with me? What is building a house and, and, and Haggai and all that? How, uh, how does that really relate to me? I just need to, I need to hear something that can be practical. I need to hear something that can help me, right? All this stuff is just too deep and over my head. And what, what does that have to do with me Answer everything, everything, because it's all speaking directly to you and to me personally. God wants to get our attention, and he's teaching us through uh, this prophetic word what it means to grow in him, to grow in our relationship with him. This is so very important. It all begins with you, first and foremost, the temple that God's building. In other words, this is amazing. Do you realize that God's glory filling the earth and his, his house, his corporate house, even his corporate house in this city, even the church here, it all depends upon whether you and I allow him to build this house because it's, 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 we're all components of the larger house, right? So, so why do I need to change? Why do I need to allow God to work in me and build his house in me and fill me with his glory? Because that's the only way it can flow into the church family to where we are a people together, a church family, whose house is filled with his glory. And that's the only way it fills the city. And then that's the only way it fills the nation. And it's the only way it fills the earth. So everything that we're talking about is not out there somewhere. It's right here. God's speaking to our hearts. Oh, that's so important. Now, God's question to the remnant in Jerusalem is consider my ways. The word consider is kantanzo, something like that, but it means to perceive clearly and to observe fully, 
to fix one's heart upon. And in context, this Hebrew word means more than just consider your ways, like, hey, where are you at? What you doing? Consider your ways. Oh, no, it's deep. It's heavy. It goes right to the heart. What it means to consider your ways, what God is saying to his people here is, <laughs> where have you been and where are you going in relationship to God? He's saying, consider your ways. You were a sinner. You were lost. But God sovereignly chose you, opened your eyes, raised you up. He gave you gifts and talents and abilities. He gave you an eternal purpose to fulfill in him. Hey, stop. Stop everything you're doing for a moment. Let's consider your ways. Why are we doing what we do? Why are you alive today? Why are you sitting in this church today and have an ear to hear? Why are we where we're at? Why has God blessed you with so many gifts and talents and abilities? What is your eternal purpose? That's heavy. He's just not saying, hey guys, what you doing? Hey all, where are you at? Consider your ways. No, he's getting deep into the heart. Stop. Consider why you're alive and what you're doing today in relation to who I am. Then he says, consider your ways. The word ways is the Hebrew word derek, derek. And it means literally, it means consider your ways. It means what path are you on, but it means what path are you on in righteousness and in God's will. Whoa. In other words, when he said consider your ways, he's saying, are you on the right track? Are you on the right track of God's purpose for your life? Are you kind of falling off the ditch on the side? Or are you right in the center? Put it all together. God is saying something very clearly to his people. He said, stop. I'm sending a prophet and he's going to ask you a question. And the question is this. Considering that God opened your eyes, saved you, that it's by the grace of God that you're alive and have purpose, everything God is doing in your life, is it in the center of his purpose and plan for your life? Ah, that's, that's heavy. Consider your ways. Wow. Consider your ways. Does your passion and desire, is it, is it, is it, is it, is it stirring you to build God's house or your own house? Are you looking to build something to your glory or God's glory? Consider your ways. Are you taking all your talents and treasures and giftings? Your very breath. And are you using it to fulfill God's purpose and to build his house? This is heavy stuff. (laughs) He's saying, listen, you started out good, but you've let this Babylonian culture assimilate. You've assimilated it. You've you've let it affect you. You've let it draw you away from your heart that once beat toward me. You had a passion for me. You had such a stirring and an excitement to be in church and to be part of my work. And all of a sudden, what has happened? Consider your ways. Wow. An unfinished temple is a divided heart that has divided affections. Now think of it this way. This is going to help you. Picture God's people. They come out of Babylon. They start rebuilding the house. They got the foundation. They got the the altar built. And then they just draw away. They just kind of draw away. It's getting a little hard, getting a little, you know, they're getting distracted. And yet they, 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 they were satisfied with having a church experience where there was broken down stones, burned out stones, there was dirt and rubble, there was confusion and chaos, and yet they're just going along and they're just saying, well, yeah, that's church or that's the temple, and here we are. (laughs) Church, do you realize that we can be the same way? What was once a beautiful, beautiful, splendid place, uh, an experience in God where we experienced his glory, where the joy, where, where his presence was so awesome and wonderful, and because things got hard, because we got distracted for whatever reason, we've done just like the, the remnant in uh, Jerusalem, we've kind of gotten satisfied with a subpar experience in God. I have to say it. Compared to what God wants to do. How glorious the church should be. How it should be the desire of our heart. So It should be like all-consuming. 
There should be a love and a passion for God and His house and His people and serving Him and His purpose. We've settled with a broken down, unfinished church. We don't expect nothing like that. We don't expect miracles. We don't expect to experience His glory. We don't expect to really change anything. But we know we need to be doing this because we're Christians. So we continue to go, come on, to an incomplete, broken down church that is nothing like the church God wants us to have. You think this is it? Is this it? I've got to be frank with you. This is broken down. Compared to what God wants to give us. Compared to what it once was. But we get discouraged. It's hard. We lose, we lose faith. So we just draw back into our own lives. But oh, we're Christians. We still go to church. But we don't expect much. You see, a lot of God's people are what are called homegrown slaves. Homeborn slaves. It's scriptural. What does that mean? Homeborn slaves were people that were born in captivity and never experienced freedom. You see, in Babylon, there was a generation born that never knew the temple of God, the house of God, the presence, the glory of God. They were born. They were children born in Babylon. They didn't know any different. They were born in captivity. They were born in religion. And you see, their parents, they hung their harps up on the willows why how can we sing a song in in this place when we once knew zion the kids that generation there's a generation in the church today that are homegrown slaves what does that mean they don't have an expectation they don't have any sense of reality they have no idea what a glorious church is what a church is that has true revival and outpouring of the spirit where there's been real renewal they've never had the opportunity to experience that so they have no faith for that and it's a lot of god's people if you've never experienced a true revival, a true outpouring of the Spirit, if you've never been part of a true move of God that is so, that so impacted you that you wanted to go to church every day, you had to be in the presence of God. God was stirring you. You had to share with everyone you met. If you've not had that experience, come on, in a glorious temple, then you don't know what you're missing. You can't compare your present day experience in God to something more glorious. Does that make sense? What does all that mean? There's more, there's more, there's more, there's more. Basically, our church experience in America is a half-completed, broken-down, incomplete temple. God, stir our hearts. Whew. So God's question, is it time? Not as in, hey, people, is it time? Uh, what time do you got? Do we have the same time? No. Is it time? Is it my set time? My Kairos time? My prophetic time? He's saying, wait a minute. In the big picture of, uh, you know, heaven and earth in, in prophetic time, do you think it's time to be consumed in your own business and doing your own thing? Or is it time? Is it my prophetic Kairos moment to get back to work and build my house? That's what he's asking. Now, notice the kind of house they built. It was a sealed house. The word is kephon. It means, oh my gosh. Everybody lift your feet. I don't want to step on toes because it ends up good. But do you know what, you know what paneled, sealed houses means? It means to hide behind. To be covered and concealed by a roof or a wall. The same word, sealed or paneled houses, what they were retreating into and building, it's the same word we see in 1 Kings when it explains Solomon's temple and the beauty of the cedar walls of the temple. What an indictment. He's saying, hey guys, remnant, I stirred, I moved upon you. I moved upon the heart of a king, a heathen king that had you in captivity. He turns around and blesses you. He gives you a decree. He gives you the resources. He gives you the commission. You go to build my house. You came out of Babylon alive with purpose. What happened? You got distracted. 
You got discouraged. You lost the vision somehow. You lost the beauty of my house and all that I had for you. Somehow you got out of the plan. You got off course. And it's bad enough you got off course, but now you're taking the resources that I blessed you with and you've consumed it to yourself. When I gave it to you to build my house. Hmm. Too many of God's people are driving around in stolen vehicles and uh, misappropriated large screen TVs and electronic devices and illegal vacations. And you go, oh my God, where is he going? This is too heavy. Because we've become so desensitized and don't even understand everything God's given us. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Are those things wrong, bad? No. But if we're pursuing those things in neglect of God's call and purpose on our lives and to build God's house, it is out of order. It is wrong. And God is coming to say, consider my ways. Oh, boy. So Pastor Louis, this is too heavy today. This is heavy. I liked it last week when we just praised the whole time. <laughs> But you know what? It is heavy because God is heavy. And if you want to be part of the remnant, that means something. It, by definition of remnant, it means not everybody can receive it. To be part of the remnant doesn't mean that you just happen to have your heart open and you're able to embrace the truth and say yes. It means you have to be able to walk in it. And to be part of a remnant means you need to be a disciple. We need to be a disciple. You're, we're not a remnant because we're hearing the message and shouting and singing songs about it. We're the remnant because we're hearing and obeying and we're entering into the cost, right, of being the remnant. I need to say this because I don't want to lose anybody. Our expression and our passion and our heart to go after God, I believe it changes. I believe there's a lot of factors involved. You know, when you first get saved, my God, is that not wonderful? Oh, my Lord. You're like walking on the, in heaven, right? You're not even walking on the earth. You just met Jesus. He's real. You're going to heaven. He forgave you of your sins. He filled you with his spirit, joy unspeakable, full of glory. It is good. But life changes. And as you begin to grow, as you begin to um, go forward, in life, situations change, circumstances change. You begin to mature. You begin to express your passion for God and your love for God in different ways. Life gets busy. Responsibilities, kids, marriage, jobs, finances, this and that and everything, right? And, and, and so we can't judge people and say, you used to have a passion. Where's your passion? I thought you loved God. What, we don't know what everyone's going through. And maybe, they, maybe you've developed a deeper, a deeper passion for God. But it's expressed in a different way. So please understand, we're not putting a standard out there and bringing everyone under a judgment. But what God is saying is, hey, consider your own heart. You need to consider your heart before God for you. It's not condemnation. It's a real word that we all need at, point, at different times in our life to say, where am I in God's call and purpose in my life? Mm -mm -mm -mm. Very important to understand. Now, a sealed paneled house is a walled house. In context, this is what God is saying. <laughs> you have paneled your private homes with nice veneer and you've made it beautiful, but there's something deeper. There's something more to it here because a paneled, sealed house is a place man builds so he can hide away from God, hide away from God's call and purpose in their life, hide away from real relationships with God and people. Consider, consider the walls we build with our brothers and sisters, with our own family members with neighbors. We build walls between husbands and wives, between our children, between employee and employer, different cultures and ethnic groups. Come on, do we not build walls to hide behind, to maintain a comfort zone, to not have to go into a place that's not easy, 
between a, a political and ideological. How about sheep and shepherd? They build walls. Shepherds build walls between shepherds. Churches, local churches build walls between local churches. And that's what he's saying. He's saying, come on, you're not building my house. You're all building your own little walls and you're hiding behind your walls and staying in a safe place so you don't have to confront real issues and build real relationships and build my kingdom. That's the crux of what he's saying. Not that they were going to Home Depot and they were spending their money on, on paneling. That's the outward, natural thing. He's dealing with a heart issue. Because the house of God is people. We build and hide out in our paneled houses and we, we erect walls to isolate ourselves Proverbs 18, 11, the rich man's wealth is his strong city, and it is a high wall. The high wall is his own pride and conceit. And we construct and erect walls when we feel threatened, offended, when we hide from responsibility, when we're confronted to change. Come on. We create our little safe place. Now, don't misunderstand me. Your house, your home should be your sanctuary. I'm not saying that. But when we build these walls around our lives to keep us protected from things we don't want to do or people we don't want to work with or, or, or offenses we don't want to deal with or what have you, we are doing what Haggai said. He said, you're building your own sealed walls, your own paneled walls, and you're not building my house. Mm-mm-mm-mm. Probably the greatest walls we construct is with broken, challenging relationships, right? Offense, hurts, wounds. We build walls. We keep our distance. We isolate ourselves. That's not the house of God, church. Look at Ezekiel 13. This is good. Look at Ezekiel 13. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will even rend it with a stormy wind in my fury. There shall be an overflowing shower in my anger. Great hailstones in my fury to consume it. Okay, go on. Right. So will I break down the wall that you have daubed with untempered mortar and bring it down to the ground so that the foundation thereof shall be discovered and it shall fall and you shall be consumed in the midst. Thereof, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Thus will I accomplish my wrath upon the wall. God's after our walls. And upon them that have daubed it with untempered mortar, and will say unto you, the wall is no more, neither they that daubed it, to wit the prophets of Israel, which prophesy concerning Jerusalem, and which see visions of peace for her, and there is no peace, says the Lord. Now, to build with tempered mortar. It's the only way we can build God's house. It must be built, God said this to his prophet, with tempered mortar, right? That means we build our, our life, our relationships with God, our, our, our husbands and wives, our children, our, our one and another, our brothers and sisters. We have to build it with tempered mortar, which is genuine loving relationships, Tempered mortar is unconditional agape love, and it's the only foundation the church of God can be built upon. It's the only foundation you and I can build that truly we can please God and build his house, allow him to build his house in our lives. We've got to use this, this, this ingredient called tempered mortar. So, to build with untempered mortar is to build with gen without genuine relationships. That's when we panel walls and we build our own walls to not be susceptible, to not give ourselves, come on, to our brothers and sisters and build the right relationship. You see, a family and a church can really look good aesthetically, but it can be built with untempered mortar. And it's only a matter of time. As you build it more, it's going to come down. It's like a house of cards. God is building his house. How many of you can be honest and say you want your marriage built on tempered mortar? We want our family built on tempered mortar. What is tempered mortar? Tempered mortar is mortar that has all the specific required ingredients and then it's mixed in the proper way. It's got to be 
all the right ingredients and it's gotta be mixed the right way. I'm a stonemason, was a stonemason. Thank God I'm not anymore. Yeah. Exactly. Well, how many times, now that you mention it, how many times have you been working on a stone wall and because the mortar had the wrong consistency, because it wasn't the right ingredients and mixed properly, you see, the laborers or the mason tenors, they think you're fussing at them. Come on, this mortar and mix, right? Well, that's the big deal. And that's the big deal because my wall is going to fall down. We have got to build the house of God with tempered mortar. And tempered mourning is God's love. Now look at this. Look, at, look what Paul said. Okay, let's bring it to the New Testament if you don't believe it. Look what Paul said to the Corinthians. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath what? God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part, part which lacks. That there should be no schism in the body, that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all members suffer. Or if one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Very important. The true church of Jesus Christ, the house of God that he's called us to be part of and he is building, it must be built, again we see it in the New Testament, with tempered mortar, the love of God, the agape love of God. Paul is trying to explain to us what the church is, right? And he's saying it's like uh, many parts of your body. You've got to have every part in the right place to function properly. Now he's saying it's like every one of us as a stone being set into a wall. You are a living stone. You got saved. You got quarried out of the earth. You were rough. And God began to chisel on you, the great stonemason in the sky, right? He began to chisel on you and shape you and work you. Why? To put you in a specific place in the wall. He has set the members. That's a masonry term. He has set the members in the wall in the church according to his will and purpose. So God's working on you, chiseling you. He's working on me, shaping me, chiseling me. Not for me to think that I have the choice to be placed in any wall I want to be placed in. He's the mason. He places you in the wall he wants you to be in. And guess what? He's shaping other believers. He's shaping your brothers and sisters the same way. And he's got a specific place for you, a specific place for me. But what holds us together? What holds the house of God, the, the, the house without, the, 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 that's inhabited with his living stones? What holds us together? Tempered mortar. His love, his love, his love. That's why it's so hard to build a church. People fall out of the wall. People get offended. People don't operate in the love of God and we got all these goofy shaped stones trying to fit in other places when God fashioned them to fit in a specific place but I'm rubbing against people that's why you need tempered mortar we need the love of God all right look at this look at Leviticus 14 42 and they shall take other stones and put them in the place of those stones, and he shall take other mortar and shall plaster the house. Oh, okay, that didn't tell you what, it, that, what that was about is when the priest saw there was leprosy in someone's house, hmm, he said, tear down the wall, rebuild it, and plaster it with tempered mortar. I'm sorry, I missed the scripture. The scripture before that talks about a house that has leprosy in it, the priest would look and go, whoa, tear down the wall, rebuild it, and then it says, plaster it, parge it up with tempered mortar. Wow, that's heavy. In other words, I mean, leprosy is sin. And leprosy is contagious. When leprosy gets into a church, there's only one thing to do. Tear it down and rebuild it and parge it with tempered mortar. The love of God, the love of God, the love of God. We need the love of God. That's why it's so hard to build a local church. Think about how hard it is to build a city church. God's after leprosy. Now, the only way we're going to ever tear down our powder walls is to acknowledge and confess that they're there and then to embrace with repentance and faith the work of Jesus. Look at Ephesians 2. I'm flying through here. Look at Ephesians 2. 
there's hope. There's hope. Look what it says. For he is our peace. He hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Hallelujah. Good news. The word wall there, the Greek word is phagamos, and it means a barrier, to block up, to silence, to stop. The first word, Haggai, I said to the remnant that will arise to build his house, he said, tear down and remove the walls you have erected that keep you from hearing me, responding to me, having a relationship with me, and having a relationship with one another. It got hard. It got hard building this house. Uh huh. It, it, it got hard on your schedule. It got hard on your time. It's not an easy thing, but that's why I called you, saved you, and called you to be part of the remnant. And what did you do? You drew away and you began to build walls to protect yourself from my purpose and my call. But here's the good news. Jesus has broken down every wall. There's no wall that exists between you and God, you and your future, you and your spouse, you and your brother and sister that Jesus has not already torn down. He has broken down. He has broken down every wall. Notice he says it's a middle petition. What does that mean? It's the soul. Body, soul, spirit. <laughs> the middle partition. The middle wall he's torn down is something he did in the soul where the will lives. Every wall is a product of your will. We need to remove a couple little letters, take out the A and put an I. And you got a wall, but you, now you got a will. God says, I'm at will both to do and work my good pleasure in you. In other words, there's no wall. There's no hurt. There's no offense. There's no disappointment. There's no hurt of the past. There's no obstinate person. There's no sin. There's no hatred. There's no devil or demon. There's nothing that can be a wall between you and I fulfilling our purpose and building God's house. He's already removed it. He has broken down. That word broken down is luo. The same word destroyed, where Jesus said, I've come to destroy the works of the devil. He has broken down, leoed, destroyed every wall between, come on, you and him and you and people. Saints of God, we've got to get back and build the house of God and be willing to let God tear down every wall we've erected that keeps us from giving ourselves wholly to build his house and his kingdom. Come on. We will every wall to exist. The good news is he is my peace. He has. Everyone say has. He has broken down every wall. It's over. He's done it. The middle wall is the veil <laughs> that separated us from the holy of holies, from the, from the very throne of God. He has torn that down. Now we can come and sit with him on his throne. We can come to peace and rest. We can come and appropriate everything he's done. And there's no wall. I want to declare it to you. There is no wall in your life. It has kept you back. You have bumped your head on it. You have run into it time and again. You've wanted to give up and quit. You've become I'm frustrated, but I want to decree to you there is no wall. Whether the devil put it there, you put it there, or God put it there, there's no wall that is still keeping you back. God says, I've removed it. It's a matter of your will to say, I agree with you, God. I appropriate that grace. I appropriate the victory that you won on the cross, and I'm going to bust through that wall, and I'm going to fulfill my purpose, and I'm going to build the house of God. Let's finish. Each of us has made a commitment to the Lord. Every one of us here, come on. Stay with me, please. Every one of us here has made a commitment to God, whether you've served God two years, 20 years, 50 years. We've made that commitment. But in that journey, every one of us here have hit a wall. How many walls have you hit? Here's the, <laughs> we hit the wall, and you know what? They're all different sizes, all different shapes, different thicknesses. But guess what? The wall is strong enough that you and your own effort, you have tried, but you cannot get through that wall. And you know what else is common to that wall? You can't go around it. You can't go over it. You can't take another path. That wall is right before you, impeding your progress in God. 
But you've got to understand something. No matter how that wall got there, whether God allowed it, the devil put it there, or more than likely, your will made the wall, that wall cannot stand before you. And here's the good news. That wall is not a barrier to keep you out. That wall is an entry point. It's a gateway to enter into something greater in God. That wall is to teach our hands to war and to deal with the enemy that put up that wall. Or that wall is to bring us to a brokenness and humility to understand, I can't do this in my strength. I need you, God. That wall is there to show you a sin or a stronghold in your life that you must deal with. How, how frustrated do you want to get? How many times do you want to smash your head against the wall before we come to the place and say, wait a minute, he has broken down every wall. Lord, this wall is here for a reason. I can't go around it. I've tried it for years. I can't bust through it. My, whole, my shoulder's so sore. I have to acknowledge it. And God will give me the grace to go through it. We've got to deal with our walls. And when we come to a wall, a typical response, oh, I'm so bewildered. I'm hurt. I'm angry. I feel so lonely. God, where are you? Why have you forsaken me? I'm weary. I have no more strength. I can't go on. And God's response is, that wall is real. And that wall was there for a reason. Because I want you to come to a place to understand in your own strength you cannot go through that wall. You must come to a place of such brokenness and humility and understand the wall's there for a reason. And that wall ultimately is an entry point to a breakthrough, a greater experience, the fullness of your inheritance, your healing, your deliverance. What are we going to do, church? Is that wall going to be a source of frustration where we get so burned out, where we just give up and quit, where we literally die? How many Christians have died in front of a wall because they just couldn't move forward? Or is it the very designated God-ordained entry point to enter into breakthrough and blessing and healing and deliverance? God's saying, church, remnant, you want to build my house? Then you've got to get real. And you need to stop and you need to consider the walled, sealed house you have built. What has hindered you from fully giving yourself to the purpose of God for your life? I look back in my life, I've hit so many walls. Some I've gone through and some I've got a headache you can't imagine from. But you know what's amazing? The first wall I hit was a wall called darkness, depression, anxiety, addiction. The wall was named sin. And I tried every way around it. I tried philosophy. I tried drugs. I tried, you know, uh, whatever. And I kept hitting the same wall. And thank God, by his grace and mercy, the wall became a door. Jesus is the door. What removed that door was crying out to God. And what looked like hell ended up being heaven. It became the entryway into my purpose, into my inheritance, into joy, into knowing and serving God. We have that testimony. How many walls have you hit? Since I've been here in Salem, I've hit so many walls. I've been ready to quit time and time again. I said, God, I can't move this wall. He said, hallelujah, no kidding. I've removed that wall. It's something in your will. Let me remove that wall. And all the betrayals and all the rejections, as I suppose and feel, and all the things that didn't work, and how many times I've just sat there and frustrated and say, I quit, I quit. <laughs> right? Das Vidanya. And sayonaro. And ciao. And see you later. I cannot stand. I'm exasperated. I'm frustrated. I have no strength to bust up against this wall again. I give up. God, where are you? Personal tragedies, hardships, and heartaches. Pfft. I give up. I quit. 
And then the grace of God says, that wall is not there to frustrate you or stop you. It's the entry point to my love and my mercy and my grace, my promises. Behind that is your prophetic word and your promises. That wall is not there to torment you or hurt you. That wall is there to help you change. That wall is there to help you grow in grace. And here's the good news. He will remove every wall. He's removed so many walls from my life, and yet there's still some that are there. And that's what he's saying in this whole message. Consider your ways. Where have you retreated from your call and your purpose because you've been hurt, you've been wounded, someone let you down, a contradiction of your faith and what you trusted. God, you didn't act the way you should act. Someone hurt me. On and on and on, and it becomes a wall that he wants to remove. Can, can the praise and worship team come up? Because we got time here. I, I'm after some walls. I'm not after them. God is. The message today, it hit a little hard. Jeremiah said, is my word not like a hammer? <laughs> you know what's interesting what Jeremiah also said? He said, he said, my ministry is to root up, destroy, pluck up. Four different words for tearing down and destroying just to build. In other words, God's process in our life, he's got to tear down and bust down a whole lot of stuff before he can really build. I want to declare to you in faith, I want to simply declare to you that God wants to tear down the wall that has been before you and him. What is it? What is that wall? Guilt? Shame? Condemnation? Something happened in your youth? The church abused you? What is the wall that you just can't get through? Good news. He has broken down every wall. And he wants this morning for us to simply consider our ways. Why are we not running after God the way we once did? I'm, I'm getting older. So I'm not going to have the same passion and zeal I had when I was 23 when I got saved. But it can be the same. It can, it can just be expressed in a different, maybe more mature way. But the issue is, do I still have that passion, that heart to run after God? Or have I built up so many walls because I've been hurt, wounded? Because I want my comfort zone. I don't want to be bothered. So I built my little sealed house here. Let's stand. Can we stand? I want you to do a little quality meditation time just in the presence of the Lord. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you what wall is it? What wall is it? What sealed paneled wall have you built that is keeping you from allowing the Lord, God, and not just going to church more, not just giving more, not just being more involved, not just has caused you to draw away from your calling God. No, no, no. What wall have you built and erected to keep God from operating and building and moving in your heart and building this house? That's the Lord. I've asked the Lord the same question. I can't preach this word unless I partake of it. Walls of pride, offense, disobedience, unresolved conflict, past hurts, wounds, disappointments. Lord, we acknowledge that wall. It's there because of our will. But you're at work, both to will and to do. Lord, I give you permission. I give you permission by faith. I appropriate the grace. Tear down that wall. Tear down the walls, God. Is there a wall between you and your family? A brother or sister? Thank you, Jesus. There's a song that we sing, and I want to change the words a little bit 
You know, there's power in the name of Jesus to tear down every wall. There is power in the name of Jesus to tear down the wall, to tear down the wall. Now, God would not speak to us not to empower us, not to move in our midst to do the work that we need Him to do. And, and I want us to sing that song. And as we sing it, I want you in your mind's eye, you talk to God, you and the Holy Spirit. And I want you to see those walls. Whatever that wall is, He's showing you. It could be a wall between you and a relationship. God, tear it down. Look at this scripture, this last scripture, to encourage you. I want to show you what God says about walls. Look at this. Violence shall no more be heard in thy land wasting nor destruction within thy borders but thou shalt call thy walls salvation and your gates praise let's take the word of the Lord with us and understand that every wall that you hit against that wall can become a gate if you approach it with praise I don't care how long that wall's been there how long it has lied to you, separated you, tormented you. We need to walk up to that wall and we need to praise God because praise turns our wall into a gate, an entry point into God's purpose and call and promise and inheritance. And then it says what? It says your wall shall be called salvation. In other words, the very wall that was restricting us, holding us back, tormenting us, that wall is truly, in reality, a wall of salvation, which means sozo, which means deliverance and healing. In other words, that wall is not there to destroy you, to keep you from God. It's an entry point to enter into salvation. That wall, come on, behind that wall, which you can remove with your praise and with your declaration, is more of God. It's all that God's called you to. It's your inheritance and your blessing. Hallelujah. No walls are going to stand. Call your wall salvation. Call your wall salvation. <laughs> now, in case, just in case, there's still a few walls standing, we need to blow it up with the mother of all bombs. God said, Joshua, you get the children of Israel and you march around those walls. You march around those walls that have kept you from your inheritance all these years. And at my signal, lift up your voice with a shout and tear those walls down. Sometimes we need some help from our brothers and sisters, right? Sometimes we need a little help from our friends. But there's power in the shout. And you know what? It may seem ignorant and foolish to those that do not believe because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God for what? The pulling down of strongholds, the collapsing of walls. And so by faith, can we this morning lift up the best shout we could ever lift up and let's shout down the walls that have kept us separated that have kept churches uh, uh, separated from churches the religious walls in this city come on the walls that have kept you separated from your family we got to tear those walls down come on lift up a shout to god hallelujah a shout. We lift up a shout. We lift up a shout of praise and victory. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Shout down the wall. Shout down the wall. Shout down the wall. <laughs> clap your hands, all ye people. Shout to the Lord with a voice of gladness. Triumph. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! They didn't just shout those walls down to clap their hands and say, wow, look what God did. Why did they shout the walls down? So they could enter in and 
possessed their inheritance. God, oh God, oh God, take it with you. When that thing comes on you, you say, wait a minute. No, 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 no. The Lord has removed. He hath, he hath removed the middle partition. He already did it. He is my peace. He has broken down, destroyed every wall. And when that thing tries to emerge in front of you, it will, it will. You say, no, I dealt with you. Out of here. You're just a vain imagination. In reality, that wall's down. And I'm entering into my breakthrough and my victory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> By my God, I can run through a troop and leap over a wall. Father, bless your people. Bless your people this morning. Lord, let us take this victory. Let us take this victory into our day and into this week. And we thank you, Lord. There is no wall that can stand between us and the beautiful, wonderful inheritance you've given us. Lord, we make a recommitment to your house and to build your kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Have an awesome day.